1873, the Trapdoor Springfield. That's the year this is the firearm, right? We are celebrating the 150th anniversary of this fine rifle, okay? was used quite a long time by the U.S. military and uh, been a long time since it was used by the U.S. military. So those were a couple of uh, 4570 rounds, specifically 4570 405, yeah, as they are designated because it was uh, 45 caliber, 70 grains of powder, and 405 grains of lead. That was, I think, the initial round in uh, 4570 uh, for this this firearm so and this is an original carbine made in 1879 but it's a model 1873 you've seen it i'll link to the video on it first video i think we've done one maybe two videos on it but it's a hundred the 150th uh, anniversary year for this thing and the cartridge to 4570 so this is a big year uh you know i've uh you know, we felt a lot of responsibility this year. 1873 is a big year. We have a video, I think, called 1873. You know, the uh, 4440 cartridge, the 1873 Winchester, the uh, Colt Single Action Army, the 45 Colt cartridge, the 4570 cartridge, the Springfield Tractor, all the cartridges and the firearms uh, came about in you know, 1873. So, you uh, by the end of the year, you will have seen videos on all three posted and the cartridges right so here we are the trapdoor springfield is on the list we couldn't ignore this baby this is again the carbine version the first one i owned was this uh uh you know the full rifle and uh it's been refinished and everything it's not quite as collectible or as cool as that one but it's still a trapdoor springfield and it's an 1884 model there were several different variations or models not a lot of difference uh, once you got the 1873 but they made some improvements, uh, quote unquote, for the 1884 model. Then I think there was an 1888 model was the last one maybe uh, in terms of the model. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that was used uh, and all of them were used all through uh, the 1870s, 80s, 90s. Actually, they were still in use by some uh, divisions or, or soldiers, right? They were using Spanish-American War along with the Krag, you know, later, later bolt-action guns. And I understand they're even used in, up into the early 1900s, you know, with some, some units, National Guard or, or, or whoever. That is always the case, you know, once a firearm is replaced, not like it doesn't work anymore, and there are a lot of them around. So different units, maybe they're not on the front lines as much, you know, still still utilize that. So anyway, yep, the old Trapdoor Springfield. I have been trying to, John, I can't figure out how it got its name, Trapdoor. You know, we've messed with it, we've studied it, we've looked at pictures, and, uh, you know, we just don't understand why it would be called the Trapdoor. But, you know, call something whatever you want, you know. We don't care, right? Okay. All right. Uh, so let's get to it now. I will link to at least one or two of the videos. Uh, follow, look at the description, people, and you'll learn something possibly, right? And uh, maybe I'll pin a comment because I've done videos on all these, these these firearms. Hopefully, you have seen them. If not, what's wrong with you? And uh, I, I'm not going to. We've done the history of military rifles, and I've done some of what I'll talk about today. So I'm, I'm going to keep it kind of brief. And I just want to celebrate this fine firearm. And you notice I pick up this one most often. Uh, I mean, the carbine and the rifle versions were both, uh, you know, they were both used as generally as usual. The infantry, uh, the army, you know, the main adoption was uh, the longer one. I think it was 32 inches in some odd, you know, fraction. And uh, this one, like 22 inches, I think, in length. And uh, the cavalry, of course, this was, you know, theirs. You know, you got your loop there. Uh, and uh but they were both both very you know, prolific they really were and uh but in, so i've got one firearm over here and i've got one over there just in uh not going back in the total history of everything that was used in, in the u.s military <laughs> but the predecessor to this basically was right the old muzzle loader right this is uh happened to be the 1861 uh, springfield rifle musket and you can see how it it you know, they look alike, don't they? We talked about that before. They don't look a lot different. If you're at a gun show and you see a bunch of guns, someone has a bunch of antique guns, sometimes you have to do a double take 
Yeah. Don't you? Yeah, especially if you're not that familiar with them. You look at a couple of these lying there, and well, same gun. Not exactly. This is a muzzle loader. This one's a breech loader. Uh, and again, maybe that's why they call it a trap door. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Uh, so military, Civil War, you know, we're using uh, muzzle loaders like this during the Civil War primarily, even though there were other guns out. So when the war ended, basically when we get into the, the trap door, the uh, military, the army was basically broke. The country was almost broke, you know, from the expense of the, the war. And uh, the cartridges were the future, obviously, because they had been around a while, you know, most of the well, rimfire, you know, the cartridges, the Spencer, the Henry, that was the future for sure, right? Uh, and that was known even during the Civil War, just how do you, <laughs> where do you get them? You can't get them fast, you can't build them, can't even pay for them, and uh, nobody could manufacture them quickly enough and all that kind of thing. That's why there weren't that many in use of the, the Henry. Uh, but they knew that was that was coming, they needed to do something. And so I think right as the end of the war, maybe even before it was over, the, uh, they, the U.S. military, uh, Erskine Allen, I think was uh, working on a way to convert these and that was the cheapest way to do it, and, and uh, you know, that way they didn't have to buy guns. I think they did it for like five bucks a gun or something. And so before this one came along, this is 1873, of course, they were doing this with the existing muzzle loaders. And it's kind of what that looks like, doesn't it? Uh, they would cut this out back here, put it on a hinge, and you know, modify it. And it was kind of like the, what genre I might do in the garage. You know, it's a redneck conversion. <laughs> and I've seen them. They're actually pretty cool. And so you had basically the the first uh, you know trap doors that were they were converted muzzle loaders, and it was I think the first ones were 58 caliber, and and then they went to pretty quickly I think a 50 50 50 90 was that right yeah 50 well 50 caliber and I think it was uh, 25 7 and 50 50 70 maybe and then 59 I don't know but it was a 50 caliber okay. Uh, soon after that. The first ones I think were 58. They didn't change the bore, I guess, on these. And then they, I think they started lining the bore, and, but they were, you know, 50 caliber, a little smaller. And, uh, and that was, those were adopted by the military and, and used pretty widely. As many, and I think they made a lot of those over that uh, five or six year period or, or seven, whatever it was, you know, between the end of the war and in 73, there were different versions of that and some improvements and so that was the the gun okay you might see one of those in a gun show i've seen and you think oh there's an 1873 uh trap door no it's a trap door but it's not this one and these were these were made up until you know around 73 with existing muzzle loaders because i think the military had like almost a million of these things on the shelves and so that was a smart route at that point uh, it, it, and to us, I think, well, yeah, really, yeah, really. Uh, one shot, and you got to flip that up, put it around. Well, at the time, the world was using single shots for the most part, and uh, it was a cartridge. This was high tech, high tech, even black powder, you know, state of the art. Uh, so to be able to, you know how these things load, you've seen us. Well, to, to be able to just flip that up, put a round in, let's go ahead and shoot it. Why? Why not? I'm talking about that. oh yeah i'm gonna get my powder caked up here if i go too long without shooting yeah put that in there and boom <laughs> two liter and white smoke wonderful huh and uh <laughs> so to be able to then pop another one in and shoot again pop another one and shoot again i've seen numbers it's hard to believe uh that they could get off 15 or 20 shots in a minute or something I, that's a pretty fast so so, you know, you were pretty well armed there, uh, even if it does seem archaic, maybe to some folks. So anyway, you had those versions of it in the 50 caliber, uh, uh, you know, the same kind of thing. But, uh, but these, when you got the 73, then this gun was made this way. It wasn't, it's, this is not a conversion of this. All the parts are new, okay? And then, uh, you know, it's, it's made that way. It wasn't a conversion. So when you get the 73, so that's a, the famous one, right? And it was adopted in 73. I think officially through about 92 when the uh, crag carbine, you know, began to take over. So, you know, you got 73, you got at least 20 years, well, about 20 years, that was the adopted rifle. Okay, all through the, the settling of the West, the, 
the uh, Indian Wars, you know, the, the Native Americans, and, and they ended up with a lot of them too, of course. And so that, that was, you know, Custer made it famous too. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of, I guess, mythology about that. Uh, Custer's Last Stand, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and some of the problems they had with it. Uh, you know, if they only had Winchesters, or only had, well, what are they going to have? They're going to have a Rimfire Henry or a Rimfire 1866. They, they didn't really want that necessarily. And again, you could get a lot of rounds off. And it's a powerful round, you know. So the problems with the Bighorns, I understand, Little Bighorn, excuse me, was uh, more just the strategy and uh, uh, Custer running in there too quickly and all that kind of thing, uh, more so than the farms they were carrying. And uh, they did have issues you know, with these copper cases. That's why I have these out, and I've shown you these before. The, this one's a 500 grain bullet, which came along around 79. I'm in the 1800s now, folks, 1879 or 1880. And this is the 405. Now, it's not flat nose like a lot of the uh, uh, 4570 ammo is today, how come? How about this for a reason? In 1873, and for what? Quite a few years, they weren't gonna be put into a tube against each other, were they? So it didn't matter, one in there at a time. So the copper did cause some issues. It expanded more, split, and they had trouble getting the cases out. And sometimes I know that I read, I've read different things, like three to 5% of the brace, the cases they found at the Little Bighorn Battlefield uh, of 4570 had been, or had the marks on where they'd been pried out of the chamber with a knife or something. And then, of course, some had a rod maybe or a stick they ran down there to get them out. But uh, I think the general feeling is that's not the reason that that uh, massacre occurred. Uh, but it was an issue they fixed with brass. Brass solved that problem. Yep. I'm glad they solved that, you know, before I got into shooting. <laughs> brass <laughs> works a lot better. Okay, so anyway, 1873, that's the model. That's why it's called that. And it was in a rifle, as you see it, two different, couple of different lengths. And uh, just, you see them in the movies and the Westerns. There were so many of them. And a lot of them are still, you find them and they're not in that bad of shape. And they're still shootable with light ammo. Ideally black powder. While I'm talking, I'm gonna make sure I don't get black powder caked up in this one. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, they're fun. And I, I have seen them and noticed them for a lot of years at gun shows. And you would think as old as they are and as cool as they are, that they'd be really, really expensive. It might take two, three thousand dollars to, to bring one home. But they're generally not that bad unless you just are that expensive, unless you just find one that for whatever reason is, it's more collectible. It just depends. They can be easily a couple thousand too, a nice one. But uh, but yeah, I see a lot of them that are pretty reasonably priced. And boy, the history of these things, just, just so cool, extra cool. There's just something about that trap door. Oh, I gave it away. I actually do know why it's called trap door, didn't I? <laughs> uh, yeah, you pull it open, flip that thing up, and that case comes out. You put another one in there and shoot again. Pretty cool, and they had a belt full of rounds. So, you know, it wasn't all that slow. Plus, you had a really nice round. They went from the, well, they didn't move to the 500 grain, but they offered and had a 500 grain bullet as well in the 1880s. And that one was supposed to be really accurate at a long range. Uh, I've got some of those actually. Uh, I've got some 535 grain, I think, rounds I got from Buffalo Arms. Oh man. Oh, speaking of Buffalo, you know, I, I hadn't fired this thing. I forgot where to hold. I'm going to try the Buffalo over there, speaking of uh, Buffalo. <laughs> I went either low or high. Isn't that smoke wonderful? You pop it up and there goes the case. So, yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool. And uh, I just, just have always liked them. John and I really like this thing. Pretty pretty cool rifle. And uh, they seem fairly durable. This one over here does not have a rear sight. It should have a Buffington sight on it. And uh, it didn't when I bought it. I got a real steal on this one. And I don't know, I've heard, uh, I've read that the soldiers they had some trouble with those big sights and that hang up in the scabbard and all that kind of thing. It's kind of a large sight. And we have decided over the years, shooting this one, that just looking down that barrel, you can, <laughs> you can actually hit whatever you want. 
and this is sort of your rear sight right here, this little groove. And so we almost don't want one of those in the way, you know, it's for longer range firing anyway. And uh, so anyway, I, I've given, I've gotten into more history and, and some of the other videos. This is again, a celebration here. Let's shoot a couple more times here. Uh, and I don't know what you'd want to know about it anyway, do I? You need to uh, do some uh, reading. They are just really uh, fascinating firearms. The design, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a jewel, it really is. How about a cowboy? <laughs> 405 grains of lead. Pop it out. And you notice how it does work there. Uh, you see the ex extractor there that pops out. I'll put a live one in there. And I'll close it up. Make sure we're pointing it down range. Okay. You see how it grabs it? That little extractor right there. And then it bounces off of this. See that little angle there? And that, that way, when it bounces back, it hits that and comes out rather than just going back against the breech face and staying there because you want it out of the firearm, right? Because when you're in an engagement, I've been in lots of engagements with these things, and that can be very frustrating. You can't get your cases out. Can I shoot it again? Keep taking my ears off. What's wrong with that blue? That blue two liter, a Kentucky blue liter, two liter looks like it's uh, low on fuel or something. Is that just the way it looks? All right, there you go. Gets that case out of the way, and it's just ready to go again. And uh, with black powder, you know, you don't have to worry about the pressures or anything and the load. As with smokeless powder, modern powder, you do. And uh, when anything, it's funny when you're reading about these. <laughs> the uh, it talks about black powder and how much black powder they put in them. You know, 70 grains. And uh, they reduce that in the carbine to, I think, 55 grains of powder. And then you got a, you know, a slower bullet, where I think it's about 1,100 feet per second. In the long, in the rifle, I think with the 70 grains, uh, you got about 1,350, you know, feet per second, that kind of thing. Now the 500 grain bullet wasn't that fast, I don't guess. But they always talk about how much black powder was in. They would load back then. And of course, at the time, did they call it black powder? I don't think so, right? It was gunpowder. Uh, you can't do that now. That's the designations on a lot of those old cartridges. One of the numbers is how much powder was in the case. You couldn't do that today, right? Go pick up some 10 millimeter. You know, what's it going to be? 10, you know, uh, uh, 7 for the grains of powder. There's a million different kinds of powder, smokeless powder, modern powder. And, you know, 7 grains of one powder might be just fine. Whereas seven grains of another powder blow up the gun, you and the house you're in, right? So, but back then, powder was powder. You're looking at it, and that's what these are loaded with. And uh, just, just so cool. So we went from this, and uh, you know, modified it, and then actually manufactured them, and, uh, and they were used for a long time until we went to the crag over here. Just get me up here into the modern era <laughs> before I go too long here. So the crag uh, was, you know, it's a Norwegian design, and uh, I guess we licensed it from them, right? And uh, I guess we had this thing about uh, trap doors, because this one had a kind of a trap door, then you open that up and you put the rounds in there. Hopefully you've seen our videos with that firearm. And you had, we went to a 30 caliber, okay, 30 caliber, 30, 40 crag, it's called. And uh, it's a cool gun. Maybe I'll link to a video on that too. Hopefully you've seen them. But nice smooth bolt. So 30 caliber and it held five, five rounds. So that was big. You know, may not think so today, but we went from muzzle loader to a breech loader, which you could load fairly quickly, to a firearm that you could load fairly quickly that held five rounds. So that's pretty nice, pretty nice. And uh, uh, it wasn't quite up to the, the quality, maybe uh, the functionality of the Mauser. It's still nice. It gets a lot of hate that it doesn't deserve too. Nice round, nice gun in general. Yeah, it's really pretty pretty cool. So that was kind of the, the uh, evolution, you know, from 1860s up until the 1890s. You know, this thing, these both of these guns were carried in, uh, you know, the Spanish-American War. Just a matter of which unit you're in. If you got a crag, you know, you might have been carrying 
little black powder just like this and of course the crag was smokeless that was one of the advantages too of that so i'm gonna can i shoot again before i let you go there's probably a million things i could i could mention but we just want to celebrate this thing today i've mentioned those million things in other videos i'm pretty sure <laughs> probably more more millions than you wanted to hear right have we shot the paper yet no what's wrong with us let's smoke up the paper Oh yeah, look at that range, look at that accuracy. Pretty cool. Let's go back over there. Uh, I, I just don't remember whether I, I need to take a fine side or not. I'm going to try the buffalo. I'm going to hold on to the top of his back see what happens. <laughs> I don't know. Let's, uh, let's hold on his belly and see what happens. You can't tell where it's going with that smoke. I hold low. Oh well. <laughs> I need to I need to figure that out again. But it's just just wonderful old guns. Uh, I'll tell you what I can tell on something closer here. Get a little bit of an idea. I'll shoot that tombstone down there back up a little bit. Alright. We don't have that much velocity. We got what about eleven hundred feet per second, I said. Big chunk of lead, but uh, I'm holding right in the middle of that thing. Okay. Yeah, I think I need to hold high, right? I'll hold a little bit higher on the buffalo. I won't take all night here. I'll just uh, mess around a little bit. <laughs> Next time I bring it out, I'll know where to hold. So, uh, it, it, if you have a pulse, any blood in your veins, your brain is in working order, and you have any interest in firearms at all, uh, one of these just has to uh, get your blood moving. Uh, they're just so neat, the, the way they operate. If somebody invented these for whatever reason 10 years ago, it'd be a fascinating, interesting, fun firearm. It, it really would. But you add uh, the history of it, and then uh, you can still buy one for a fairly reasonable price and actually shoot it. Uh, it just adds immensely you know, to that experience. But just so, so cool. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, and again, carried. You see them in the movies, in the westerns. You know, the cowboys always have their lever gun or something, but the soldiers ride up, the cavalry, and they've got one of these, right? And, uh, yeah, one of these, this very, this very uh, rifle. You know, uh, this one was made in 1879, like I said. So, I should, I did, I think, in one of the videos, I brought out the Colt, uh, U.S. Colt, cavalry Colt that I have. It was made in 1883. So, in the 1880s, uh, who knows? The, the same soldier, or in the same unit, the cavalry, might have been carrying this exact rifle uh, along with my other, you know, revolver that was made in 1883 or something. So it's fun to think about, you know. Or they might have just been in somebody's library in a gun cabinet. <laughs> Who knows? U.S. Can I fire one more and I'll let you go? Okay. One more round at something. Maybe at the gong. Just to end the celebration. Actually, we're not going to end the celebration. It goes on all year. Goes on forever. Yeah, I'm not sure where to hold. Cool gun, and uh, let's eject one more time. <laughs> uh, one of the coolest guns ever made. Uh, it really is uh, in U.S. history of firearms. And I'm just glad you could be here to see me lob some 4570 slugs in the authentic weight, I think design, the authentic powder through an authentic firearm at a couple of really authentic two liters, right? So glad you came by and really appreciate your support. Life is good. Oh yeah, that's better. This is a great gun for defense. Oh hey, didn't see you guys there. Uh, while I've got you here, I want to remind you of our friends over at Talon Grips and Ballastall. Talon Grips makes uh, grips, can you believe it, uh, for all different types of firearms. You can get rough texture or more of a rubberized texture. Uh, it just sticks right on there. 
you know, really affordable, really cool option to in, improve the grip for your handguns um, or, or rifles. Uh, so please check them out at TalonGunGrips.com. You'll be glad you did. And also Ballastol. Uh, Dad has been using Ballastol for many years. It's a cleaner and a lubricant, and it's non-toxic. Uh, it works really great, and we're happy to have them on board since it's been a part of our shooting endeavor for a very long time. So go to Ballastol.com, TalonGunGrips.com. And also, while you're out there, I'm juggling all these things here. Also, uh, while you're on the internet, please do check out our other social media like Hickok45 on Facebook. There's also Hickok45 on Twitter, the real Hickok45 on Instagram. There's a John underscore Hickok45 on Instagram where I do some things. There's Hickok45.com. Uh, you can find us also on GunStreamer. So check out all that stuff and then watch more videos.